Hi, this is Steve Andres. I'm the pastor of New City Church, and this is our podcast. Every week at New City, we invite people to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and learn how to make a difference. I want to thank you for joining us today, and I hope that this message inspires and challenges you to love God and serve your city more. If you want more info on New City Church or other resources, go to newcity.life today. But for now, enjoy this message. I love Fourth of July, and it's a great opportunity to, to be grateful for our country and all that, that God's done. And the, the fireworks, they're awesome. I love it. The fireworks are a little personal for me. I've got to be honest. I take them personally, uh, primarily because the week before Fourth of July is what I call the week of death. Okay, And it starts off with Father's Day, which sounds like a great opportunity for me as a dad, but I pay for everything. So I don't know how that works. No one's, I'm paying. Right, so that right there, that's, I start off at a deficit. Boom, deficit number one. Then June 27th is my wife Amy's birthday. Boom, deficit number two. June 29th is my, my daughter's birthday, Cameron, my youngest. Deficit number three. Then my mother-in-law's birthday is that same day. I'm like, you can't make this up. So I gotta remember my mother-in-law, my daughter, my own kid. And then not to, not to, to, to add the, the cherry on top, July 2nd is my wedding anniversary. 11 years, phenomenal, we made it. Started from the bottom. And now we're here. And so, like, it's just, and so the, the, the fireworks are for me. Like, they're not for the country. They're for me. I see that as a culminating event to go, we made it through Death Week 2021. We made it. But I, 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 love, uh, I love the week, actually. I, call, I jokingly call it the Death Week, but it's awesome. I love giving gifts. I love receiving gifts. My mom was a huge gift giver. Like, we lived in a 1,000-foot square apartment, and she would be, like, finding areas in the home to hide gifts. And then, like, you would think all the gifts were done. And she's like, pa. And it's like, how did you get that from the toaster? Isn't that going to break? So it was just phenomenal. She would be pulling out game systems from the, from the microwave. It was awesome. It was a great time. So I grew up loving gifts and receiving and getting gifts. But one of the, my favorite things to do is actually watch people get gifts. I actually enjoy to see their reaction. Uh, I, I love that. And uh, I remember one time, particularly at my job back in New York, when I was working in New York, we, uh, we, we did a secret Santa with all the staff. It's about 100 people on staff. So you don't know who you're going to get. They give you a $30 maximum, right? And you just secret Santa. It's not like the office. No one was, uh, no one was stealing gifts here. It was, it was a legit secret Santa. And so I sat next to two gentlemen, one named Andre, who was a friend of mine, and I knew Andre had James as uh, the person he was supposed to buy. Now, the way this particular Secret Santa worked was you never revealed yourself, right? So James was going to get a gift from Andre, and both of them were sitting at my table. And I knew the gift. It was like Andre bought James this toy car that you built. It was like a, a man, adult toy car. I would have not necessarily, you know, that would have not been my thing per se. You know, I would... I would have preferred the gift card. I can't <laughs> just give me the gift card. I'll be great. But I wanted to see the reaction. And James, you got to understand James in order to get the story, is that James was a little bit like, um, he had this sense of just being abrasive and straightforward. He will tell you what he was thinking. And so it was the moment of truth, right? James gets the gift. This is big box. So he's excited. He's like, I can't wait. He rips open the box and he gets it. And he goes, who would get me a toy car in front of Andre? And Andre's just like, sinking in his seat. It was like the most awkward moment. And what really, what it made me realize is it's one thing to understand the purpose of a gift. That's cool. But there's nothing worse than having a gift and not appreciating the gift. That's like the worst thing. Right in front of you, this guy spent all this time to think through a gift and he was just like, oh, why would someone buy this for me? And he had to live with that. And I'll be honest with you, when I think about the word of God, there's so many gifts that we have given from God that we don't think about on a daily basis oxygen, the Bible, and the one I want to talk to you about today is prayer. Prayer is a gift. Think about this for a moment. Some of you can't even get in contact with your, the CEO of your company if you wanted to. Prayer gives us the opportunity daily, momentarily, however frequent, however long you want, to be able to communicate with the God of the heavens and the earth. Some of you can't, you can't get in contact with me. I, I just put my phone on silent. I, I, God who created everything is going, hey, I want to have a conversation with you today. What a gift. What a gift that we oftentimes just don't take, we take it for granted. We don't appreciate the gift that's given to us in prayer. 
And I was reading an interesting book. It's called Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes. I'm about uh, three quarters of the way done. It's a real dense book, but it's strong. And in the book, the author, Kenneth Bailey, talks about this experience he has. I want to read to you the entire encounter because I think it's important. He says, after the fall of the Soviet Union, I was privileged to lecture in the Latvian Lutheran Church. Most of the participants in the seminary were between ages 25 and 35. This meant that all their education had been in the communist state system, which was determined to indoctrinate them with atheism. So for just to explain this, he, he goes and he's ministering at a seminary where they were indoctrinated to become atheists, right? And then he talks about this conversation he has with this young girl. And the conversation goes like this. He asks her how she came to faith. Was there a church in your village, I asked. No, the communists closed all of them. Uh, did some saintly grandmother instruct you of, in the ways of God? No, all, my members, all the members of my family were atheists. Uh, did you have a secret home Bible study or some, some sort of underground church in your area? No, none of that, she answered. So what happened, he asked, and then she tells the story. At funerals, we were allowed to recite the Lord's Prayer. As a young child, I heard those strange words and had no idea who they were talking to, what those words meant, where they came from, or why they were reciting them. When freedom came at last, I had the opportunity to search for their meaning. When you are in total darkness, the tiniest point of light is, bright, is very bright. For me, the Lord's prayer at that point was the point of light. By the time I found the meaning of the Lord's prayer, I had become a Christian. Prayer is a gift that has the ability to change our lives. It has the ability to change your circumstances. Think of the thing you're facing right now that you're thinking about subconsciously in your mind. The car payment. How I'm going to pay for my kid's tuition. How am I going to get a job? I just got evicted. I'm looking for this. I'm looking for a spouse. I need this. I need that. Think of the thing that you need. The Bible or, or the situation just tells us that in that, if you pray to God, the Bible tells us, it can change your circumstance. In fact, I love how uh, Soren Kierkegaard, he was a Danish theologian and a philosopher. He says it like this, prayer does not change God, but it changes him who prays. I believe that when we utilize the gift of prayer, it has the ability to change our lives. It has the ability to change us. And we've been on this amazing series looking at the sermon on the mount, Jesus' sermon on a mountaintop and, and, and just kind of on a mountainside. And as he's been going through these different things, he stops and he pauses and he begins to talk about prayer. And I want to pick up the story today. I'm going to read this verse to you. These verses is found in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. I'm reading from the NIV and then we're going to pray together and get started. It says this, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. God, we thank you for this moment in time to be present with you. And we don't take it for granted, Lord, that we have the ability to access you as we commune and talk with you. So we, we say thank you for that. I pray today, Lord, as we get ready to dive into your word, that you would speak to us, Lord. We, you would speak to us individually. You would speak to us collectively. And I pray that you would use the words that you've given me, Lord. I pray that I, you would help me to step down and step out so you can step up and step in. Bless us today with your word in your name. Amen. Jesus is sitting on the, the mountainside and he begins to instruct not exactly how you should pray, but he gives us a formula, if you will, on how to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who've sinned against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. He gives this structure on how to pray. He shows us this model, if you will. And to understand this, you have to understand what happened right before as Jesus is teaching on the mountainside, he does a couple of things. He says, hey, when you are praying, don't pray like the people who just ramble on and on. My God, my Father, my Lord. My, that's not like an auctioner, right? My God, my Father, my God, my Father, my Father, God, my, my Father. He said, don't do that, okay? That's not going to work. That's not going to work for me. Jesus is like, don't do that. 
then he also says, and don't be like the people who try to be fancy and pray out loud, right? Like, you know those people that, like, when it's time to eat at a restaurant, you just see them real loud. Oh, God, we thank you. Like, yo, I'm just at Pizza Hut. Like, I, I, I don't really need that. He says, don't, don't babble, don't ramble, and don't be out loud and rambunctious and try to get everyone's attention. When you pray and you're praying, pray like this. And when we look at this, I want to break this into two parts. I want to give you two simple principles today that are gifts that we have and they help us to pray. And the first one is simply this, the gift of acknowledging his power. I think when you look at this sermon on the mount, this moment of prayer, he teaches us the gift of acknowledging his power. He starts off by saying this, our father. I love that when we look at this, this is not the singular pronoun. This is not my father. This is not you praying and saying, God, answer me. He starts off by saying, our Father, almost as if to let us in on a secret that we are a part of something bigger than ourselves. Jesus starts off the entire prayer to help us keep in mind the big plan, not just our individual circumstances. That's important because I don't know if you've ever had this. I don't know if you've ever been facing something. But when you start praying for somebody else and their needs, it automatically takes your eyes off of your problem and puts it onto the size of our God. He starts off by saying, our Father. And, and I, love that, I love that moment. Some of us, I, I preached on Father's Day, and I understand that some of us may have not had the best earthly examples of fatherhood. I get that. Some of you may have had a great father. Some of you may have had a mediocre father. Some of you have, may have had a not-so-great father. I don't know where you are on the spectrum, but fatherhood uh, is really, earthly fatherhood is a representation of God our Father. It doesn't mean that it's a perfect example. It just means that there's some similarities between earthly fathers and, and God the Father. For example, uh, you look at earthly fathers. They, they are a source of life. They, they lovingly correct. They provide needs. They, they, they give wisdom. And when I think about this, the best way to describe the reflection of your earthly father as it pertains to your heavenly father, it takes me back to August 2017. It was a summer day, and there was a solar eclipse happening on the East Coast, particularly in New York where we were living. And I remember as a dad, I was super excited, like, oh, this is cool. We get to see a solar eclipse. But um, I didn't realize you needed, like, special goggles. I just thought you could put on some Ray-Bans and you'd be fine. And that wasn't the case. You needed special goggles. So I go to get the special goggles, and they're sold out. And I'm like, okay. I don't know what we're going to do. Let me go on Google. I go on Google. I start searching, and I found this whole makeshift kind of MacGyver-style goggles you can create this experience. And this is a picture of me and Charlotte, my, my oldest. We use this makeshift object. Uh, it's a, basically, we took a cereal box. Okay, I, I failed science multiple times, so I don't want to sound cool. I don't want to sound cooler than I am. I just want to just be vulnerable. You take a cereal box, you put a white piece of paper in the cereal box, then you cut a hole on both sides, a little square. One side you put an aluminum foil and you poke a hole, and then when you, you have to stand, if the sun is this way, you stand at an angle, and the sun or the solar eclipse reflects into the aluminum foil, and inside the box on the white paper you see this reflection of the solar eclipse. I was mind blown because me and Charlotte, we would have just been like doing one of these real quick, like trying not to like get blinded. But when I found, I was like, thank God, thank you, Jesus, for the cereal box. That's how I felt in that moment. I was excited. I said, this is awesome. And what happened was it wasn't the actual solar eclipse. It was the reflection of the solar eclipse. That's what fatherhood is in our, in our earthly sense. It's a reflection of God the Father. It's a reflection. So it may be challenging at times for you to take the experience you have with your earthly father, but you have to realize it's completely different. So when you're praying to our Father, you're looking at the, the God who created everything, heavens and the earth. He's loving. He's caring. He loves you. You have to view it through the lens that your earthly father, no matter how great or not great he was, is just a reflection. Then the next part of the prayer blows my mind. Our Father who is in heaven. So not only do you have to know who he is, but then you have to realize where he is seated. And I love this because this is important. I grew up in, in, in New York City in a very urban context. And something they would do in the 90s that they would no longer allow to happen now is they would send kids from the urban to the suburbs called the Fresh Air Fund. It was a camp that you would go to where they would put you on a Greyhound bus and you would stay with strangers for 12 days at a time. And my mother would lovingly send me off waving at me as I was on the Greyhound bus with tears. Like, why are you sending me to these straight? I don't know these people. They sent me to Richmond, Virginia. 
That couldn't happen today. That literally could have happened because you don't know what, things are just crazy. That could have happened, but they would send me and my big old self about to go eat all the things out of these poor people's home, right? Like, and they would send me on a bus and I would, I would go stay at this family's house for 12 days. It was this cool program that would immerse suburban children with urban kids and vice versa and create this bridge. And it was super cool and it was super awkward. And my mom sent me multiple times. Horrible, horrible experience. But I remember one time going to Richmond, Virginia, and I went to this family's house. And I remember when I was driving from the bus depot to their home, you know, I, my, you, you just kind of... you. I'm observant, okay? I watch everything. I see everything that's happening. So I notice, okay, the grocery store is here. That's about 10 minutes from the house. I just, I just kept that in my mind. Ding, stored it. Okay, grocery store, just in case I got to make a run for it. It's a left. You go down the block. Okay, cool, I'm good. I had the whole thing mapped out in my head. And it was a great time. Like, the mom was so sweet. She would, like, she would, they had a tree. They had, like, a legit tree house. Not like a, like a, no, they had like multiple trees that lost their life for the sake of this kid having a tree house, okay? It was expansive. It was massive. It was huge. It was awesome. They had this tree house. They gave us ice cream. Like, it was amazing. And I remember one night in particular, she was like, hey, we're going to watch, uh, we're going to watch a movie and make peanut butter and jelly and have milk. And I was like, yeah, let's go. This, let's go. But again, being observant, my mom particularly taught me this. You got to watch how much food is left. So I noticed from the corner of my eye that the bread was really low. Like there was only like three or four pieces left. So I'm thinking to myself, you know, I got to, because the grocery store is 10 minutes away. It's already 9 p.m. They're not going to go. So I just, you know, I grew up in an apartment. I don't know anything. I'm like, no, don't worry about it. And she was like, you sure you don't want it? And I'm like, no, I, I don't really want, because there's not enough bread for all of us. And so she was like, no, no, I'll go to the pantry. And I was like, the what? I'd never heard of a pantry before. I don't know what that is. See, you, you take that for granted. I, didn't, I had a cabinet, singular, one, that stored every, I didn't have pantries. I don't know what that is. So I'm like, what's a pantry? And then she walks to this, these two doors and just opens them. And it's like this aura, like this orange beam, this beam of light. Like all of a sudden it's like shining. It's like an angel is going to flap out, out of it. It was incredible. It was awesome. And they had multiple loaves of bread. And I said, Wow. I didn't realize you, I just thought the grocery store held the bread. I didn't realize you could buy multiple loaves of bread. And so we had our sandwich and it was awesome. And it was great. And I tell that story and in a reverence way, I want you to understand this. See, the Bible tells us in Malachi 3.10 that where God is seated is called the ultimate storehouse. There's an ultimate blessing. Listen to these words. Bring the whole tide to the storehouse that, uh, that you may find food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room for you to store it. Here's what I've discovered. When you acknowledge the power of who God is and you acknowledge where he is seated, all of a sudden it changed your mind. The reality is God is seated at the ultimate pantry, the ultimate storehouse of blessing. And he is waiting for us to come to him to be able to swing open the window so that you can receive the blessing that he has for you. But often we view God as only a cabinet God, that there's only one way to get to him and there's only limited amount of blessings. But if we were to realize that, the, that where he is seated in heaven is the ultimate storehouse of blessing, it will change our perspective. It's important for us to acknowledge the gift of his power. You have to realize who he is. He's not just my father. He is our father, plural. He's not just a God who sits with me and is with us. He is also in heaven, seated at, in heaven with the ultimate storehouse of blessing. And I want to encourage you today. I love how R.A. Torrey, who's an evangelist and a pastor, he said this from the 19th century. He says, prayer is the key that unlocks all the storehouses of God's infinite grace and power. Listen to this. All that God is and all that God has is at the disposal of prayer. What a gift that we have right in front of us that we can maximize and utilize at any time. And you know when we regulate, we, we regulate prayer to the times of going, God, thank you for this food. We bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Who knew we had this power inside of us to access the storehouses of God? So you get this, this idea of God, our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Then he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, I, I love this part in particular. This is one of my favorite parts because when I grew up, I heard this phrase all throughout my life that I was longing to say when I became a parent. It's a phrase that has, it's, the, it's like the card that you just throw us, the trump card, the ace of spades. Bah, and I throw it on the table all the time. I do it all the time. My kids would go, Papi, Papi, can we do this? And I'll say, no. And they go, why? 
And my response, I just bring it out. Because I said so. Bah! And there's nothing you could do. There's nothing you could do after that. What are you going to do? I'm like, what are you going to do, Ben? What are you going to do? And he's just like, he's like calculating. It's like, that's, that's chess. That's checkmate in that moment. Because I said so. I was raised on it. I, if you've been a parent, you've not exercised that authority. Let me, let me encourage you. Be, because I said so. It's phenomenal. Because Amy and I will walk through stores, toy stores in particular. We'll get to Target, the toy section, and we'll see parents nudging on their, uh, kids nudging on their parents to buy a toy. And we see the parent do the, hey, let me rationalize with you. No, 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 I'm not rationalizing. Because I said so. Because I said so. It's a, powerful, it's a powerful tool to use for, I see Taylor and Nathan here. As you become parents, you want to use that tool. Because I said so. It's a great tool to use. And the reality is there's a similarity when we use that to our children as God uses with us. It's called sovereignty. And the reality, sovereignty means this. It means God has the ability to do what he wants when he wants. When you surrender to the sovereignty of God, it takes any situation you're facing and it puts it in the right perspective. In fact, I love how the psalmist says it in Psalm 115.3. He says, our God is in heaven. Okay, so he's there. And he does all that he pleases. Think of how liberating it is as a person to no longer try to manufacture your own blessing and try to concoct the right situation to make sure that it goes the right way. And you no longer have to be an architect that is trying to blueprint out the right things to do for your life. You can surrender to the sovereignty of God. And you can pray, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I don't need to do that. You could do that. It's almost like when you acknowledge God's power... It helps you with the second gift. The second gift I'm going to show you in a second. We've been blessed here at New City. We have three interns that are interning with us. My buddy Kiva Denson and Jake Farley and Tim Medina. They're phenomenal young men. Can we put our hands together? They're, they're doing things you don't even know about. They, that coffee you drank today, Kiva crushed those beans with his hands and just massaged. I don't even know how coffee's made, but however it's made, he did that. Kiva did that. They're great, though. I love the interns. And one of them, Tim Medina, he's become a dear friend of mine. I love Tim. He's a good friend of mine. I met Tim because Seth, who's on staff with us, he's our production director, he was supposed to help me. When we first moved here, uh, we were purchasing some uh, furniture from Facebook Marketplace, okay? I love the Marketplace. I scout it out all the time. And Seth was supposed to come with me to go pick up two couches in the city. And Seth didn't come. Wherever Seth is, I just want him to feel that with the pause, with the elongated pause. I wanted you to feel that. But Seth didn't leave me stranded. He didn't. He didn't. He sent me his brother-in-law, Tim. And so I had never met Tim. And if you meet Tim, you'll see him. He's the one that carried it up here. He's a, you know, strong guy. I love Tim. He's awesome. Tim is a man of few words. So we're, we're driving, you know, you know Chicago traffic. Like, we're in the thick of it in a U-Haul. So I can't even get on certain roadways. I'm just, and we're, and like, you know, so Tim, how you doing? Good. Three hours. Three and a half hours we did that. It was great. It was excellent. But Tim and I became really close. And this is when we became close. We're driving and we get to the place and we get up the stairs and we see the couch. And the couch probably weighed about 1,500 pounds. I mean, it just felt like that. And I'm like, Tim, like, what's the best angle, man? Like, I'm like, I'm like bending my knees. I'm like, like, what's the best angle, bro? And Tim is like, oh, actually, what you want to do is you want to just grab it with a hand like this. And he just lifted it up. I was like, yo, how'd you lift that up? I'm over here struggling. I'm like trying to use all my might. Tim just goes, nah, bro, you just got to do it like this, man. You just got to do it like this. And Tim is just like jacked. I mean, so we went to get the second couch. I was like, yo, man, what do we do? And he's like, this is how you want to do it. And he did one of those. I said, man, that, Tim, that's amazing. And so it was great. We picked up three couches that day, threw them in the truck. It was awesome. We had a good time. And I knew because of Tim's strength, the next time I needed help, I was going to call him. And sure enough, my dryer went out. And where did I go? Do, 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 do. Facebook Marketplace. Hello. Trying to find a little discount. Found a nice dryer on the Marketplace. Almost brand new. You know who I, I said, hey, Tim, you free tomorrow at like 7 a.m.? He was like, let me look at my schedule. Yeah, I'm free. I said, great. And me and Tim went. And he's like, hey, me, here, bro, that's how you pick up the, the, the washer. You got to pick it up like this. And I'm like, it's a washer machine. I can't do that. He picked it up. Then Richie, who was on staff with us, him and his wife, Emily, were getting rid of some hardscaping, some, some, some big boulders, okay? And, you know, you look at a picture of a boulder. You go, what's that, like 150, 200 pounds? It was about 489 pounds. Tim, just one scoop. Yeah, bro, I got you, man sweating profusely, throw it on the car. It's amazing. But you know what I realized? 
When I realized Tim's strength, it made it easy for me to ask my need, right? When I realized how strong he was, I knew I could make my request to him. When we acknowledge the gift of God's power, it gets us to our second point. It helps us to realize the gift that we can make our appeals to him. When you acknowledge someone's power, you're e- it's easy to make your appeals. And this is where we get the second half of the, of the scripture here. This is where Jesus says, give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I want to break this into three parts, starting with give us today our daily bread. I love this. This is a quote from N.T. Wright. He's a, he's a phenomenal writer. He says this, the danger with the prayer for bread is that we get there too soon. What does that mean? Oftentimes, we start prayers off with what we need. Give me this. Why? Because we live in a microwave society, and what we really want is, can you answer my prayer quickly so I can move on to the next thing? But there's something special about asking God, give us today our daily bread. It's a momentary thing. In fact, it comes out of Scripture. Jesus is referencing Exodus chapter 16. When the Israelites are in the wilderness and they're wandering through the wilderness, God promises them a way that he will provide for them. And he says, the way I'm going to provide for you is daily, and it's through something called manna. It's this bread that will rain down on you. And guess what? When you get the manna, you can't take manna today for tomorrow. You can only take manna today for today. It's almost as if Jesus, as he's giving us the structure of prayer, is teaching us in this moment that there is provision found when you are currently present. In the moment. My wife and I have been off social media for seven and a half months, and it's been absolutely revolutionary for our marriage, for our life. Like, I'm realizing things about my children that I never realized about my wife. I'm like, you wear glasses? I didn't even know you. No, I knew, I knew she wear glasses. I knew that would be horrible, right? But that's the way it feels. It's like, man, my son, I'm like, man, you got tall. Man, like, I'm looking at my son, like my kids. It's just awesome. And it's really the gift of de- detecting, as Amy would say, and being present in the moment. And there's so many little gifts that come when you are present. See, oftentimes we come to church and we check in and we think, we're thinking about Monday. All right, I got to get to church today because I know that Monday I have this, this, and this for work. I, I, okay, I get to church on Sunday and I'm thinking, what are we going to eat for dinner? I get to church on Sunday and I'm thinking about... In two weeks, I'll leave for vacation. What shorts do I want to buy? And this is how we are as humans. We are constantly on to the next one. And friends, when Jesus is giving us this structure for prayer, he's teaching us that in the moment that we are present, there's provision found. You will find provision in the present when you are focused and attentive. What does that look like for us? Maybe earlier today when Celeste was leading us in worship and we got to that hymn and it reaches to the highest mountain, it flows to the lowest valley, Maybe it was possible you were facing a situation. And maybe because this, this theater doesn't have service, you were present in the moment. You couldn't look at your phone. You were just in the moment. And you thought about that situation. And because you were here and you were in the zone and you were focused, those words ministered to you. Maybe you felt something. Maybe your hands lifted up when you said, thank you for the blood. That's called being present. And when Jesus is praying, give us today our daily bread, it's not just for the provisional things that we need in terms of food. He's teaching us to be present. Give me today what I need today. Then he teaches this. He teaches the next thing. He says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Back in June 17, 2015, I'll never forget where I was when the news came out. There was a a terrible act, a, a terroristic act on an AME church, AME Emanuel Church in Charleston, South Carolina, where a young man walked into a church and shot nine parishioners. Terrible act. I remember where I was. I could still get emotional thinking of the people. We, it was a Friday. And we were on our way to a church service. I can remember just the feeling of just, man, we can't even come to church. Like, you come to church and you get a shit. This doesn't make any sense. I can remember that strong feeling. I remember tracking with everything that was happening on the news and everything that was going on. And, and one of the, the parishioners who was killed, her daughter spoke during the bond hearing where, this, where the young man was, was up for bond and they're trying to figure out, they, they gave an opportunity to the daughter of one of the women who died and mur- who were murdered that day. They gave her an opportunity to speak. These were her words. Listen to these words. The first thing she said out of her, out of her mouth, I forgive you. You took something very precious away from me. 
I will never get to talk to her ever again. I will never be able to hold her again. But I forgive you. I have mercy on your soul. You hurt me and you hurt a lot of people. But listen to this. But if God forgives you, I forgive you. Why is that so powerful? Well, I think it's because if we're all honest, we could think of two people in our life always. A group of people who have hurt us and a group of people we've hurt. And I'll be honest with you, it is so much easier for us to focus on the people who hurt us as opposed to thinking about the ones we've hurt. And at the top of the list of the people we've hurt is Jesus. The Bible says that the wages of sin, the wages of our action deserve death. We've trespassed against God. The Bible says in James 2.10, if you stumbled on one sin, you've stumbled on them all. What does that mean? When I lie, in God's eyes, remember, he's like on an airplane. You know, you can't tell a Toyota from a Mazda from a, a Tesla when you're in an airplane. You can't. You just see cars. When you've stumbled on one, you've stumbled on them all. When you've lied, you've committed adultery, you've murdered, those all to God, they all go into the same category. And you know what ends up happening? We are so quick to forget that we've been forgiven and we're so quick to hold on to those that have hurt us. When Jesus is teaching us a model for prayer, you know what he's saying here? It is important, it's imperative. I implore you that if you are going to pray, that you not only ask for, that you not only remember that I've forgiven you, but you forgive those that have sinned against you. And if you think I'm making this up, in the same passage, Matthew chapter 6, verse 15, Jesus says, if you do not forgive others, your heavenly Father will not forgive you. We have this misconception like God forgives everything. Whoa, whoa, whoa. on the contrary, Matthew 6, 15. If you do not forgive others, your heavenly Father will not forgive you. My wife and I just experienced one of the most tumultuous times we've ever dealt with, the most ter a terrible situation with a family member. And the first words out of our mouth when we had the opportunity that they, that person trespassed against our family, the first thing we said was, I forgive you. Not because I'm great, not because my wife Amy is great, although she's phenomenal. There's, there's, there's nothing in us. It's the fact that we know we've been forgiven much, so we should forgive much. The last and final thing Jesus says in the prayers, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It's almost like Jesus is foreshadowing another moment. Jesus foreshadows this moment in the Garden of Gethsemane when he's praying his final prayer. And he brings three of his best friends, James, Peter, and John. He goes, come on, come with me. I'm going to go pray. And, and he goes, hey, guys, I need you to stay up and pray for me. And this is what he says. In Luke 22, on reaching the place he said to them, he tells Peter, James, and John, pray that you will not fall into temptation. And then he withdrew about a stone throws beyond, beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but your will be done. I love this because Jesus is not giving us a formula to just apply occasionally. He's giving us a formula that he lived out himself. Lead us not into temptation. Oftentimes, one of the things that hurts us is that we look at Jesus and we can solely see the divinity of Jesus at the expense of missing his humanity. We can look at Jesus as the savior of the world, right? This, 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 this cosmic figure, but forget that he was fully human. In fact, there's a phenomenal Bible teacher who I love named Brad Gray, and he says, if you are faithfully living out the rest of the prayer, you will be tempted. When Jesus is talking here, he's not omitting temptation. He's not saying pray that temptation won't happen. He's saying pray that you're not led into it the way he was in Matthew chapter 4. He was led to the wilderness to be, to be tempted. The Bible tells us that's going to happen. And when you're living out the rest of the prayer, those moments of temptation are going to happen. But what I love is he says, deliver us from the evil one. Another moment where he's surrendering to the sovereignty of God. Another moment. Prayer is a gift. It's a gift that we don't often use. It's a gift we don't often utilize. I'll be honest, my prayer, my prayer life has gone through the roof since we've had children. Children just, they, they pull something out of you. 
If you haven't had children yet, or maybe you don't plan on having children, work in the youth ministry with Richie. Your prayer life will just go through the roof. It will. It'll just go through the roof. You, you have kids, and I love all my children. They present different challenges. They present different struggles. My son, who's in the room right now, who I love dearly, his name is Benjamin. He's amazing. He's sharp. He, he loves reptiles. He knows all about lizards and animals. He's amazing. He's a great kid. He's adventurous. He's so many things that I'm not. But one of the things about Ben is Ben has been a, a, a challenge for us as parents. We, we've had to go, God, help us. Because Ben requires a lot of attention, and he does a phenomenal job with it. He keeps us on our toes. And it's so easy for Amy and I to try to concoct a solution. What if we read this book? If we talk to this person, they can help us with what he's struggling with. They can help us with this, that, or the other. And I actually love that he's, I love that he's here right now because his sister, my mom, I told you about my mom who constantly sends us gifts. My mom sent my, my daughter a gift. There was this prayer box. Let me show you this picture. It's this cool prayer box that my mom sent to my daughter, Charlotte. She says, Charlotte, start writing your prayers down. It's a little box, and it has these papers in it. And I, I didn't realize Charlotte was doing it every night. And the other day, Amy told me that she looked through Charlotte's prayer box with her permission, of course, and she found dozens of prayers for Ben, dozens, dozens. Let me, I asked Charlotte for permission. She gave me permission to show you two. Here's one of the prayers. It says, Please help Ben to catch up what he is learning, to, catch up to what he is learning in school. And the second prayer is my favorite. It says, Dear Lord, please help Ben to be someone very godly. Amen. I don't know if I would have articulated like that. It's easy as a parent to allow the frustrations of fathering to, to, to kind of skew how you view things. But when I read that, it just hit me. Prayer is a gift. It's a gift, and we don't utilize it. There were dozens of prayer, little prayers like that, dozens. God, help him. Help him with his nightmares. Help him with the foods he doesn't like. Little prayers from my daughter who's modeling and watching what we're doing and going, God, I want to put this into action. Prayer is a gift. Prayer is a gift. I love how the psalmist says it. In Psalm 34, 17, he says, the righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their trouble. Is it possible that maybe the trouble you're facing today is, is it's still so big in your life? I would almost ask you, are you crying out to God? Are you crying out to God or are you concocting your own plan? I, I don't know which one it is for you. Are you manufacturing things or are you surrendering to the sovereignty of God? I don't know which one, I don't know where you land. And you may hear scripture like that, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. You may hear that and you may go, well, I'm not righteous. What about me? I've made too many. You don't know what I've done. You have no idea the mistakes I've made. You're right, I don't. I don't know what you've done. But I can only stand on the word of God. And can I tell you what Paul, the apostle Paul, writes in Romans 3.22. This is from the New Living Translation. We are made right with God by placing our faith in him, Jesus Christ. And this is true of everyone who believes, no matter who you are. I love that. No matter who you are, no matter where you come from, socio no matter your socioeconomic status, whether you came from a lot of money, whether you came from no money, whether you came from the urban, whether you came from the suburban, whether you came from, uh, whether you came from a, a single family home or whether you came from a, a, a typical nucleus with two parents, but no matter your circumstances, whether your father was present or absent, whether he was in the house but abusive, or whether he was not in the house but sent money, I don't know what your situation is, but can I tell you what the, what the Apostle Paul says? That we can, we can be made right with God just simply by believing in him. Listen, there's a lot of celebrating that's going to happen tonight as fireworks goes up, but there's no greater celebration than the fact that I was once dead. I was dead. See, you look at pastors that grab a microphone and come up here and share, and you think, man, those are just good, righteous, perfect people. I've probably done worse than anyone in this room, and we can put money on it. I've been the worst of sinners. Paul says that in the Bible. He says, I was the chief sinner. I was on top of, I've sinned more than anyone, but yet there's forgiveness found in the blood of Jesus. We saying thank you for the blood almost as a precursor to the fact that we have been washed and we've been made right. You know what that means? 
You know what that means? That when God sees me, he doesn't see me as my sin. He sees me as a saint. He sees me as righteous through his son. When God looks at me and I'm calling out to him for prayer and I'm saying, God, I need you because I can't do this. He's not looking at me going, well, you made that mistake the other day. He's not doing that. He's viewing me through the lens of his son who died on the cross and made me right no matter who you are. Another translation says whether you're Jew or Gentile, no matter who you are today, you can be made right with God. You could be made right with God. I'm going to ask you in this moment, because we're going to have the worship team come up. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and bow your head. The reason we do this, just so you know, no one's going to steal your purse, okay? But we actually do this as an opportunity not to be distracted because what's about to happen right now could be life-changing for someone. Prayer is a gift. And even as we started off with, with Soren Kierkegaard's words, prayer doesn't change God but it changes he who prays. There's going to be a prayer and an opportunity here that has, the, uh, that has the chance to change someone's life, to change the trajectory of their lives. You go, what is that? Well, first of all, you may be saying to yourself, okay, you said that I, I could be righteous. How, how does that work? Like, I don't know. I don't have a relationship with God. I got a ritual. I come three times a year. You may say to yourself, well, I've messed up too much. Well, listen, I want to give you an opportunity to begin a relationship with Jesus. I'm not offering you a ritual. This is not something that a priest or a pastor or some program can fix. This comes with a relationship with Jesus, and it's called being born again. It's not words that New City made up. I didn't make it up. Jesus, in a conversation with a man named Nicodemus, said, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, if you want to go to heaven, you have to be born again. All right, you got me. I'm sold. What's born again? How do I do it? Being born again is as easy as ABC. It first starts off by, A, admitting that you are a sinner. You know what Paul writes in Romans? There is no one good, no, not one. The one who thinks he's the best, the one who thinks he's the worst. It's right in the middle. There is no one good, no, not one. You have to admit that you're a sinner. So in your heart right now, you could just be saying, God, this is what I would be saying. God, I've made some mistakes today. I've made some mistakes in my life. I have not done everything right. B, you have to believe. In that same conversation with Nicodemus, Jesus says these words, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. You gotta believe. And C, you have to confess. Paul writes in Romans, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that he rose from the dead, you will be saved. With no one looking around, I wanna assure you that there's no one looking around. If you're here today or you're watching online, and you go, hey, pastor, as you were talking, that's me. I want to start a relationship. I don't want a ritual. I don't want a routine. I want a relationship. If that's you with no one looking around, I just want you to lift your hands. I just want you to lift your hands. Jesus. If you're online, I want you to lift your hands even at home as a symbol of saying, God, I need you. And we're going to pray a prayer. I see that hand. Praise God. I see that hand. Thank you, Jesus. I want to pray a prayer. You can put your hand down. Thank you so much. And if you're online, I want to pray a prayer that has become... It's become a mantra for us. It's good even for believers to hear this prayer and say this prayer because it's it's the prayer of acknowledging his power and acknowledging that you can ask him for an appeal. I want you to repeat this prayer out loud, everyone as loud as we can because we want to celebrate what God is doing in the life of of someone who just raised their hand and even those online. Come on, say, Dear Lord Jesus, Jesus, I believe that you're the Son of God. I believe that that on the cross cross, you took my guilt my sin and my shame and you died for it you faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to and you rose again to give me a place in heaven a purpose on earth and a relationship with your father today Lord Jesus I turn from my sin to be born again God is my father Jesus is my savior The Holy Spirit is my helper, and heaven is my home. In Jesus' name, 